recording. So it is it is with great honor that I'm welcome, welcoming today uh, a very um, a very brilliant researcher and a friend of mine, Sophia from uh, University College London, uh, and she's joining us from there right now. Uh, we thank her for being with us today. So first, I would like and I would like to introduce her um, officially. So let me uh, just share my screen. And uh, here we go. All right, so we have with us today uh, at the um, uh, seven future directions of artificial intelligence workshop, Dr. Sophia Bano from the University College London. And it is with great honor that we are uh, hosting her today uh, virtually. So Sophia is a senior research fellow with interest in computer vision and artificial intelligence applications in healthcare. She received her PhD from Queen's Mary University of, uh, University of London in the UK and Technical University University of Catalonia, Spain, uh, through the Erasmus Mendes Fellowship, so she got an outstanding fellowship. She is now associated with the Surgical Robot Vision Group in the Welcome EPSRC Center for Interve Interventional and Surgical Sciences in the UK, and this is one of the largest funding body in the UK, EPSRC. Uh, she is working on the guided instrumentation uh, of for fetal therapy, fetal therapy like babies, QTs, and surgery uh, as part of the GIFT Surge project. Uh, she is keen at establishing collaborations and uh, at international level, and we collaborated on one paper, we should do more. Uh, she has worked previously on augmenting, uh, augmenting communication using environmental Mental data to drive language prediction project as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Dundee, and that's what we, where we met uh, there. So um, I'm very uh, delighted to have you with us today, Sophia. And um, okay, so welcome to the session, and thanks you, thank you for being with us. And there are lots. I showed you not the open, the empty tables. We have people with us here, so the floor is yours. I'll let you share your screen and uh, start the session. Thank you so much, Islam, for a great introduction. And actually, it says the host has disabled uh, screen sharing. So I think you need to allow me some access. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm sorry. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Make <laughs> co-host. Yep. OK, yeah, so I can. Um... Excellent. Yeah, we can see you. OK, so thank you so much. Um, Islam for inviting me and for this uh, great introduction. And it's my great pleasure to be here today at this workshop presenting about my work on artificial intelligence in minimally invasive surgery. Uh, so as Islam mentioned, I am associated with the uh, uh, University College London, UCL, which is actually located in the heart of London, minutes away from all the major attractions in London. Uh, and um, Within UCL, I am part of the Welcome EPSRC Center for Interventional and Surgical Sciences. Uh, where at this center, uh, engineers, scientists, and consultants they work in collaboration and uh, work together to bring novel techniques into clinical practice. So uh, again, this vice center is formed of several research groups, and uh, I am working as part of the surgical robot vision research group, uh, where we are working on um, devising new techniques for computer assisted intervention, intervention and surgical data science. We are working with clinicians uh, from, uh, for uh, building applications for ophthalmology, gynae, neurosurgery, fetoscopy, general surgery, uh, gastrointestinal surgery. Then we are also working on uh, computer assisted diagnosis and uh, medical imaging, where we are analyzing uh, fetal ultrasound or pathology images or periapical x-rays. And a good number of my colleagues are also working on uh, soft robotics and surgical robotics, uh, where we are looking at surgical and soft robots, which can uh, uh, enable highly precise, robust, and safer surgery. So before jumping into uh, the technical or exciting part uh, of my talk, let's briefly talk about what actually is artificial intelligence or AI. Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, the cap capability given to machines to memorize and learn from experience 
to solve a task in a way uh, like humans do. And within AI, uh, there is a subset uh, uh, which is machine learning, uh, which uses statistical methods to enable machines to improve with experience. And deep learning, again, is a subset of machine learning, which makes the computation of multi-layer neural networks feasible. Um, then the second part is minimally invasive surgery. So minimally invasive surgery, also sometimes referred as keyhole surgery, is a procedure which is performed through small insertions uh, instead of large openings. Uh, there are several advantages of minimally invasive surgery where uh, the duration of hospital stay becomes shorter. It, it has uh, introduces less trauma to the patient, less pain and less blood loss and smaller skin scars. But uh, while there are many advantages, there are uh, some limitations on the clinical side uh, 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 or towards the surgeon side uh, for minimally invasive surgery where uh, this procedure can be performed only by specialist surgeons. Um, the field of view in minimally invasive uh, procedure is really small. The maneuverability uh, given to the surgeon is very small and all these in introduces or increases the cognitive load of the surgeon. So with AI, why we need AI? for minimally invasive surgery. Uh, these limitations that I mentioned can be overcome with the help of AI. Uh, AI can improve the surgical outcome. It can reduce the risk of errors and complications, and it can reduce the uh, 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 misdetection rate and uh, persistent occurrence of a condition. Uh, in my today's talk, I'll be covering several uh, topics I've been involved in uh, related to uh, uh, AI in minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and specifically, I'll be uh, talking about uh, fetoscopic surgery, which uh, from past three years I've, I've been working on as part of the GIFT Surge project. And alongside, I've been involved in several other projects, which I'll be briefly talking about. So. Uh, from uh, uh, today's talk perspective, we'll be talking about uh, mosaicing or field of view expansion in uh, fetoscopy, surgical event detection, surgical scene understanding, which can help uh, create an overlay uh, of uh, different uh, uh, semantics of the scene and can help the surgeon in better guidance, classification and detection of anomalies or lesions uh, 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 through automatic uh, AI solutions, surgical workflow analysis, and uh, in terms of soft robotics, identifying the target area where uh, the drugs can be delivered uh, 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 for uh, using a soft robot. So moving on to the first topic, uh, which is fetoscopic surgery. Um, fetoscopic surgery is used for the treatment of twin to twin transfusion syndrome, uh, which, where um, fetoscope is a very miniature endoscope uh, with a very small diameter of about one to four millimeter and a working channel length of 20 to 30 centimeters. It has a monocular camera that is that guides the surgeon during the procedure. Uh, 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 during this procedure, a fetoscope is inserted through a small incision uh, in the abdomen in, into the ab amniotic um, um, uh, abdominal ball and uterus into the amniotic cavity, and then it is used for uh, doing the treatment. Uh, so, twin to twin transfusion or TTTS is a fetal anomaly which affects identical twins sharing monochronic placenta. It affects about 10 to 15 percent of the monochronic twins and if left untreated it uh, uh, leads to fetal mortality or abnormality. During this condition the flow of blood between the two fetuses becomes uneven as a result the donor experiences much slower growth while the recipient uh, because, uh, is at a risk of heart failure. So uh, fetoscopic laser photocoagulation is the technique that is used for uh, treating this condition. Where in uh, fetoscopic laser photocoagulation, the surgeon first visually inspect uh, 
the placenta using the fetoscopic camera to find or to identify the abnormal connections or vascular anastomosis sites. Uh, then uh, once these vessels are localized, um, uh, then uh, the surgeon uses a laser tool to ablate these vessels to disconnect uh, these connections so that the flow becomes even. For a safer procedure, it requires clear view of the placenta uh, and uh, uh, free of occlusion and free of uh, presence of fetus in the environment or in the local neighborhood and a clear path for, between the ablation and the target vessel. There are several uh, clinical challenges in this procedure, as I mentioned before, while talking about the challenges of minimally invasive surgery. Uh, firstly, uh, is the very narrow field of view and constrained environment uh, in this very delicate procedure. And then poor visibility, because at times the fluid turbidity is so high that it is hard to uh, see through uh, uh, this, this uh, intraoperative environment. Uh, this can result in missed anastomosis and can result in persistent TTS, uh, TTTS condition. So we started looking at mosaicing or image stitching for increasing the field of view of surgeon in this particular fetoscopic procedure. This uh, kind of technique can be extended to any minimally invasive procedures as well, but here we are specifically target, targeting fetoscopic surgery. So mosaicing is basically uh, used to align overlapping images to generate increased field of view uh, image of the surgical environment. Uh, it helps in mimicking surgeon's cognitive load and it is in the localization of vascular anastomosis sites. So uh, here I would like to uh, quickly ask a question. So uh, have you ever uh, used your mobile phone for creating panoramas? I'm sure you, uh, all of us have done that where whenever we see a nice landscape scene, we try to uh, stitch or create a panorama using our mobiles. Uh, this experience is quite nice, but I, I, I doubt uh, many of us have tried creating a panorama from a textureless scene, for example, for sky, uh, or even, um, let's say, of water surface. So in these kind of scenes, since there is no texture, there are discontinuities, and the gener generated panorama may not be very nice or appealing. Uh, this is acceptable in image processing or in our pho uh, um, photo libraries, but uh, this uh, is not accepted in uh, mosaicing for fetoscopy or minimally invasive surgery because th this introduces error in the, in the generated mosaic, which can misguide the surgeon. So from the technical perspective, uh, these fetoscopic videos here, I'm showing uh, some clips from six different videos. They have poor visibility, low resolution, low illumination, and fluid turbidity. And occlusion due to the presence of fetus or working channel port, uh, specular highlights and reflection, uh, and dynamically changing views. Um, uh, this results in um, lack of long-term consistency in the uh, mosaic algorithm. Uh, so we are looking at designing novel uh, deep learning based solutions that can overcome these uh, challenges. Uh, so I think my computer since this morning is giving some green screen issue, but if I do this, yeah. Uh, so we are developing a deep learning based techniques for mosaicing where in our initial work, uh, we tested uh, sequences of a uh, phantom placenta or uh, simulator uh, of uh, fet fetus in, in, in a simulated environment and then in vivo or in utero uh, uh, placenta sequence. Here in this uh, initial study, uh, we managed to uh, get very reliable mosaics Yet there was drift uh, um, in, in the sequence, uh, which is, uh, makes uh, the clinical analysis a bit more uh, unreliable. So one common feature in uh, fetoscopy video is the presence of uh, placental vessels, which can help in us in improving uh, the mosaicing algorithm. So we started looking at uh, vessels uh, for uh, segmentation, for doing mosaicing. Uh, since vessels 
uh, has dual purpose. So if we can identify the vessels, they can help the clinicians to find or better localize the anastomotic, uh, anastomotic placental uh, vessels. And it can also uh, act as a unique feature for registration and mosaicing. Uh, so in, in this way, it can overcome visibility challenge and it can uh, guide in the localization of the vessels as well. So um, in, in one of our recent work, uh, we uh, uh, developed a deep learning based technique for uh, placental vessel segmentation using the uh, well-known UNET architecture from deep learning, uh, where we manually annotated a data set of about 500 images from six in vivo uh, fetoscopy videos and used it for uh, training our network. Then once we get these segmented vessels, um, uh, we use these uh, segmented vessel maps uh, uh, and apply a direct registration method for creating the vessel mosaic. In the same way, uh, the transformations that we obtain from the vessel mosaics, they can be used for RGB uh, frame registration as well. So this is uh, something that we get. Uh, 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 as a result of using placental vessels for mosaicing many of the visibility challenges in lighting conditions and the presence of moving uh, occlusions are filtered out and vessels are found uh, to be unique uh, recognizable shape. But here again, there is uh, some limitation because there are some uh, parts of placenta where either the vessels are very thin or they are not present. So in that kind of situation, this algorithm may fail. So uh, here I would like to point uh, the audience to our data set, uh, fetoscopy placenta data set that we released last year. And if you are interested in uh, segmentation or registration problem, I would encourage you to check out this data set and do reach out to me if you have any questions. So let's also have a look at uh, a few more uh, uh, results from this, where uh, I am showing in this uh, slide uh, comparison of vessel-based method with a direct image re registration method or RGB image registration method, where we can clearly see there is noticeable drift in this sequence while vessel-based registration method is quite accurate. And in this low, uh, example at the lower side, we can see that image-based method uh, tends to uh, lose tracking while the vessel-based method is quite consistent. Along this same line, uh, our current data set is captured from only one center or at UCLH. Uh, we started looking at collecting a large scale fetoscopy data set, and then we organized a challenge uh, in uh, uh, one of the top conference, uh, Mekai, uh, this year, uh, where the idea was to crowdsource uh, 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 this problem uh, and get the solution uh, for placental vessel segmentation and placental RGB frame registration for mosaicing. Again, here, I, I would like to in, uh, encourage you to check out this challenge website. Uh, here is the link to that. So, fetoscopy uh, video itself is about uh, 20 to 30 minutes long. But with uh, the current methods, we are only focusing, mosaicing methods, we are only focusing, uh, focusing on segments which have a clear view of the placenta and then using these for uh, mosaicing. These are just a couple of seconds long uh, segments. So can we then say that mosaicing is solved for fetoscopy? Uh, not yet, actually. Uh, the end goal is that we can analyze the whole sequence of fetoscopy and can better um, localize uh, or relocalize uh, the vessels uh, and map them simultaneously in this environment. So uh, we, uh, in this regard, we started looking at uh, fetoscopic event identification where um, segments of uh, fetoscopic videos where there are occlusions are not suitable for mosaicing. And uh, while doing fetoscopic event identification, we can filter out these segments. 
for this task, uh, we uh, generated a frame level manual annotation data set uh, from seven petoscopic videos uh, and then use this data set for training spatial temporal uh, models for event prediction. So here you see some quick result where uh, we can see in the field of view there is some occlusion because of the presence of fetus uh, and this is uh, detected by the algorithm. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, one more uh, 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 qualitative example where the ground truth is labeled here in green along this axis. Um, the predicted probabilities are shown uh, here where in blue are is the result from our method. And then the predicted labels are shown uh, with the, the colored box uh, filled with yellow. Uh, and again, uh, focus, we can keep our focus on the blue ones, which is our method, and it has been compared with two other methods. So again, here we can see uh, in this scene, tool and occlusions are present, and the methods uh, are able to detect uh, both these events. And in this uh, second example, occlusion tool and tool while it is oblating, so it is uh, shooting the laser, uh, is present. And again, uh, the algorithm works quite well in this scenario as well. So along this same line, uh, uh, even detection uh, kind of algorithms can be related with the surgical workflow recognition algorithms as well. Where in surgical workflow recognition, we are interested in um, segmenting or uh, detecting the different phases of a surgery. So each surgical uh, uh, procedure can be divided into different steps or phases. Uh, and by measuring these different phases, we can uh, uh, train the novice surgeons to become an more expert surgeon. And it can also help in monitoring uh, uh, the procedure for any errors as well. So uh, here we see an example from a uh, cholecystectomy data set where the procedure is split into uh, seven different phases which are listed over here and the timeline or duration of each phase is represented in this color bar over here. So just to uh, uh, sum up what I just said, uh, uh, surgical workflow is essential for context aware computer assistive intervention system uh, which can uh, monitor surgical phases, optimize staff scheduling, provide assistance to the surgeon, automate the indexing of surgical video database uh, for skill assessment, like training to, um, uh, to expert surgeon and uh, 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 upward curve analysis. And then it can also help in alerting the surgeon if, uh, for a possible uh, complication in the procedure. So at our center in WIFE, um, we are working on surgical workflow analysis for two, uh, uh, two surgical procedures. One is uh, sacrocopopexy, which is a surgical procedure used to treat pelvic organ prolonged. Um, and then the second one is endoscopic pituitary edema resection, which is performed through the nose to remove tumor from the pituitary gland and skull base. Uh, in, the, in these works, we are interacting with gynecologists and neurosurgeons for collecting the data and getting the expert uh, knowledge in uh, these particular kind of procedures. Uh, so moving on to another example uh, or another work that we are doing is an anatomical site classification for upper gastrointestinal endoscopy where GI and biopsies are gold standard procedure for diagnosing gastric cancer. Um, it is a, a widely used procedure, especially in geographical regions with high disease incidence. And early gastric cancer and other significant uh, pathology can be easily missed during GI endoscopy due to potential blind spots. Uh, therefore, a uh, mapping of these upper GI tracts through the use of standardized photo documentation is considered a unique indicator. Um, however, there are various guidelines and it's challenging to find a specific guideline that can meet the need for photo documentation uh, and um, manually annotating 
uh, these uh, uh, photo documentation is time consuming task for the clinician as they have to go through the whole duration of the procedure to find the relevant frames. So there, there is a need for automatic photo documentation method to support efficiently, to support and efficiently improve the quality of endoscopy. In this regard, we started looking at a fusion of two, uh, two uh, guidelines, one from the Chinese guideline and one from the British guideline, where they uh, observe different regions uh, uh, during GI endoscopy, uh, but uh, the number of regions observed in a British uh, examination is much more fewer than the one in Chinese. While in the one in um, Chinese examination, they are uh, so much spread out that the clinician never uh, view those view uh, uh, or observe those views during the GI endoscopy. So we proposed uh, uh, a hybrid of these two uh, guidelines. And uh, as a result, uh, we came up with 11 classes uh, and, uh, and a uh, non-applicable class uh, for observing these different uh, regions in the GI tribe. These are the most relevant uh, uh, sections which are prone to have some signs of um, cancerous tissues and uh, are the most important ones to be observed. And then we trained uh, uh, deep learning networks for the automatic classification of these networks, which can then enable automated photo documentation and reduce the load from the clinical practices. So uh, moving on to the final um, uh, topic that I want to cover today is uh, on uh, fluidic uh, soft robot for intratympanic steroid injection. Um, so hearing loss affects a large portion of global population. The World Health Organization estimates the, that around 5,000 um, uh, five mil 500 million people worldwide are affected. Um, of that, uh, sen sensory neural hearing loss makes up to 90% of the burden. Uh, so intertempanic uh, steroid injections are offered uh, at, as an effective treatment, but there are risks since the treatment of the inner ear is quite difficult. So such injections are commonly administered by trained ENT surgeons and require the use of large microscope to, uh, to provide a close-up view of the site. So in advice, we have been designing and developing uh, a soft robot that can support this particular type of procedure, the intratympanic steroid injection, and uh, can uh, actually uh, improve the outcome of these steroid or, uh, injections or drug delivery. This work is led by my colleague, Lucas, uh, who is designing uh, this robot, and we already have a prototype of this robot uh, 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 up, up and running where a uh, flu, uh, flu, uh, fluid activated robot uh, is used for steering the needle uh, and pointing the needle to the right uh, uh, quadrant of the tympanic membrane that can be then used uh, as an indicator of a safe point where the needle can be inserted for the drug delivery. This novel robotic system has the potential to significantly descale this procedure, ensuring more accurate drug delivery. Uh, here, I would like to also mention that uh, alongside the robot design and development, we are integrating AI and vision with this robot uh, that can help in targeting uh, the, the site or a site uh, 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 that can be used for the drug delivery. So to sum up, uh, what's the future of AI in surgery? AI in surgery can help uh, in intraoperative guidance uh, to the surgeon. And as I've, I've mentioned through mosaic free field of view expansion, this can uh, uh, reduce the cognitive load of the surgeon. So uh, this can provide real time and highly precise uh, uh, solution uh, with high resolution virtual overlay as we can see over here. And uh, on the other side, surgical robot, uh, robotics have, uh, can provide high precision, robust, and real-time safe solutions. 
these kind of systems are already being implemented in virtual environments where uh, they are used uh, by trainee surgeons for getting uh, uh, trained for particular kinds of procedures. So in the end, I would like to uh, thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take uh, these questions and feel free to reach out to me even after uh, uh, this uh, workshop session. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Let's give her a round of applause here. Okay, so I think, uh, let me just turn this on. Okay, uh, so maybe you can, uh, if you would like, you can stop your uh, screen sharing and we can have a conversation so they can see you in high resolution. Um, great, so I, I know this has been so heavy for many of you, like a lot, a lot, like you are about to have lunch and there are a lot of like, you know, photos that are a bit, you know, <laughs> provocative. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, so uh, could you stop the screen sharing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool, so awesome. Now we can see you full screen and I can just, you know, uh, put you right here, okay. So uh, I do have a, a few questions, excellent. So uh, any questions from the audience, please feel free to um, ask. So I know that you're using, we were talking this morning about AI and how it is uh, basically, um, you know, like we were talking about the issues of reproducibility and generalizability to unseen data. So you have been collecting a lot of data from different parts of the body, fetal data, you know, uh, intestine data, and all of those videos you're feeding them into your AI system to uh, do prediction to detect abnormalities or to, for example, you know, like insert, you have now like robots that you're sending AI powered mini robots into the ear and they can smartly find the place where to be like, you know, where they need to um, act basically. So uh, this is all impressive and it's like really high level research and high level work uh, when it comes to using AI uh, inside our bodies, right? So the question that I have is like, how much can you trust it? So basically in terms of reproducibility, we have seen that if you change the data, you might not have the same exact accuracy, okay? And you're about to insert something into a human body and like let it decide on its own what needs to be, you know, to be done basically. So uh, what are the challenges to that? Uh, how much accuracy we need to have to trust the model? How much can we trust? These are the first questions, and then we can go to the next ones. Yeah, so yeah, that's a very, very, very good point, actually. So if we cannot trust them, we will never take them into, into the patient. So this is the first point. The second uh, thing I would like to highlight is, is that, yes, um, if you get new data, new data from a different center, these models does not work. And that is the issue with AI and that is the issue with deep learning as well. Uh, it needs big data and it needs uh, more and more data to create generalized models. So for, for addressing this second problem, uh, as I mentioned, we have been collecting multi-center data from different sites across the Europe uh, on fetoscopy. And then um, in the first round, we are annotating part of this data for training the model. In the second round, we are uh, looking into uh, moving ahead uh, to other types. So this first part is called supervised learning. So in the second part, we are uh, moving towards semi-supervised or self-supervised learning, where we have a big repo of the data, which is unannotated, and a small repo of the data, which is annotated. And using this annotated data to generate pseudo labels for unannotated data so that we can improve our models. Mm -hmm. So uh, so in this way, we can create more generalized models which can cover a wide spectrum of, uh, for example, this particular kind of uh, fetoscopy uh, view segmentation problem. And so, uh, uh, and then uh, now uh, coming back to the first point where uh, is it safe AI in human, taking AI into human? So there is a standard protocol of taking or designing a technique, AI technique, and then taking it to clinical practices. Most of the work that I've shown today here is at research level or investigation level. Taking this into clinical practices will require first achieving, let's say 99% of the uh, performance. Second, uh, getting a proper route, proper ethical route, 
uh, that uh, in which uh, uh, experts are involved uh, that are that have even more concern about patient safety. So uh, through this approval, we can only then take this solution into clinical practices. And then having said that, when we talk about taking AI into clinical practices, we are not saying we are at this level where we are not giving the full control to the robot, let's say, or full mm -hmm. control to the uh, to the uh, to the algorithms. Uh, these are uh, algorithms are for supporting the clinicians. Even the robotic solutions are for supporting the solutions. The main uh, the uh, the clinicians. The main task is still performed by the clinicians, where they get, for example, an expanded nice view of the placenta, so they don't have to think too much about uh, where should I go or an overlay of hidden vessels in the scene. So if they if you they can see hidden vessels in, for example, cholecystectomy procedure. Uh, they can, uh, 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 this will reduce the risk of error or cutting a different, a wrong artery, for example. So that is where we, the AI is taking us right now. <laughs> oh, that was a very extensive answer. Thank you. So to summarize, so first uh, you had multi-center data. So they collect data from different hospitals, right? And that's how you can generalize because you're training your model on multi-center data. The second you mentioned about uh, super self-supervised learning or semi-supervised learning, which means they're using labeled data, but la data without labels, without any targets. There is nothing we know about the target or the output of the data. Still, we can use that data to increase remember the space that we had about the data, the possible observations. So I'm connecting to what uh, we had earlier. And uh, the third point, which is so cool, you said it's not AI that is in control. It is the clinician who is in control, but he's using it and he's monitoring and supervising. So mm -hmm. it makes sure that whatever we're using is not uh, okay. Like it's not harmful. However, I, have, I do have a question. So how far are we from the translational stage where we take AI to real hospitals, to real surgeries with that 99.9% .9 or 1%, how far are we from there? So I know this has been exploding with all these deep learning models and architectures, and we're gonna talk about that later on a bit more. So how far are we actually from the real translation of AI into uh, clinical hospitals and facilities? What is so, your vision? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very, very good point. And uh, as part of WISE, I am aware that um, once um, we have a, a, a technical system or a model that is performing, outperforming even the clinician. So we have trials where we uh, kind of offline first test these models uh, and compare their performance with the expert clinician. And then we have uh, taken this initiative of creating small startups that. Uh, take these uh, solutions into clinical practice. Uh, so here I would like to actually highlight one of the startups that we have in VICE, Audion Vision, where uh, they are designing tools for polyp detection in a colonoscopy. And these tools are already uh, being taken into clinical uh, practices, not just mm -hmm. trials, but these are now used in clinical practices uh, where uh, uh, they are reducing the risk of uh, for for polyp detection. There is a high risk that the clinician can miss some polyp site, which does not look uh, um, uh, very. Uh, uh, they can have various types of shapes, so which does not look like a polyp, and they can miss where AI can detect these sites. The other thing is there is a possibility that while moving the the endoscope or colonoscope inside the patient, they can miss some regions, but the, these uh, AI tools uh, provide an indicator of if there is anything missed. So yes, um, for some particular procedures, these are already being applied into clinical practices, while for other procedures, this is still at research and investigation level. Thank you. Well, that's, 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 that's fascinating. So basically, um, you mentioned about this startup where they're like Actually, they're using these uh, things. Awesome. So I do, um, I have something to say um, about like an, another thought about this. Uh, so basically, so once once you have a startup and you're doing these uh, non-invasive surgeries and you're using AI, you mentioned something that uh, really uh, struck me. So you struck me, sorry. So you said AI powered uh, endoscopy outperformed clinicians because sometimes we might miss out something, right? So like you have mentioned through, you have, show through these clinical trials that sometimes it can outperform, but when we use it, 
we use it to augment our capacity. So we want to have better clinicians. We want to have, you know, faster diagnosis, more accuracy in whatever surgery they're performing. So uh, the last question I want to ask, if we don't have any more questions, is AI our ally or our enemy? Because, you know, sometimes you think about, okay, if AI will be able to do all these things, sometimes it might take my own job, right? So how do you see this balance in like, you know, the next 10 years or like particularly in medicine and clinical, you know, non-invasive surgery area? So I would not say AI is our enemy. That is a picture that's been portrayed through all these science sci-fi movies. So that, <laughs> uh, and they're not even in the next hundred years, AI is going to take, uh, empower us, let's say, take over us. So that's a kind of wrong misconception. Uh, then, uh, AI is kind of a support tool uh, that is enabling better surgery, uh, improving the surgical outcome. And without, uh, there are there are scenarios in this very constrained environment where they use endoscope for, let's say, view, uh, viewing the uh, surgical environment or the uh, uh, interoperative environment. AI is just providing some guidance in this environment and it is reducing the risk of any error that a surgeon or clinician can make. And if, if a surgeon is making a, like a, an error in these procedures that results in them redoing the procedure, uh, which can be a bit uh, not uh, nicer for the patient as well. But with this AI support as, as a tool, it can help in better uh, localizing these uh, abnormal sites Mm -hmm. and better better oblating uh, these sites in the first round uh, so that we, they don't have to re-perform this procedure over and over again. So uh, yeah, I would say AI at this stage is the support tool, which is j providing just the guidance for the surgeon, uh, removing the cognitive load that they have. In what, so if they have to perform like 10 uh, procedures in one day, they might get exhausted, exhausted by the end of the day. So. AI is actually supporting the surgeons in different okay. kinds of surgery. So it's our good friend. Cool. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sophia. Uh, any questions from here? Anyone else at all? Okay. I would like to thank you for joining us today and thank you for uh, giving us, you know, uh, some new insights about uh, the world of surgery. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that was a great talk. Thank you so much and take care. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank you Thanks. and have, have a good rest of your day and a nice workshop. Thank you for <laughs> joining us today. Thank you.